there's a lot more to do in London than just stare at Big Ben and the London Eye. So in this video, I'll be sharing a thorough roundup of things to do in this amazing city, separated by neighborhood for ease of exploration, with honest opinions on which famous activities are worth skipping. In case you're new here, hi, I'm Christina from happytowander.com. And this channel is all about practical travel tips, so be sure to like and subscribe if that sounds like your kind of thing. Because we have a lot of ground to cover, this video will briefly introduce each activity. But be sure to consult the free written version of this guide for more. And stick around until the end for a free map that plots all these activities along with recommendations for pubs and restaurants. Now, before we go into detail with London attractions broken down by borough, I have to say that the number one London must do, especially for those on a time crunch, is some kind of sightseeing tour of all the major landmarks. There are few cities in this world as iconic as London, with countless buildings and attractions immortalized over the years in TV shows and movies. So getting to see them all is really such a treat. My personal favorite way to see London's landmarks is on foot, but there's also no shame in hopping on a sightseeing bus tour to give your legs a rest. Though I'd honestly recommend booking a tour rather than a hop on hop off ticket since London's normal bus system is better suited for that purpose. Another great option is a boat tour on the Thames. There's a ton of different options, but I found the Uber boat to be a really comfortable and more affordable option compared to the special made boat tours. That said, it's still not the cheapest, so keep that in mind. All right, with that out of the way, now let's move on to things to do in the city of Westminster. This borough is home to some of the most iconic sites in London, starting of course with Elizabeth Tower, or as it's better known, Big Ben. Although technically speaking, Big Ben refers to a bell inside of this famous tower, these days the name is synonymous with the entire structure itself, which is hands down one of the most famous sites in London. A photo here is a must, although if you want to get up close and personal, you actually can book a tour to reach the top. Do note that the tickets sell out very quickly though, so be sure to check the official tickets page for details on the next drop. UK residents can even book this tour for free by writing to their MP. Now of course, this famous clock tower doesn't just stand on its own. It's actually part of the Palace of Westminster, a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is today home to the UK's Houses of Parliament. Again, a photo of the gorgeous neo-gothic exterior is a must, but if you want to see the inside, which I can definitely recommend, you can actually book a tour, which is another activity that happens to be free for UK residents by writing to their MP. Another must-see in this area is Westminster Abbey. With its present structure dating back almost 800 years, this magnificent Gothic church has hosted countless royal weddings, coronations, and state funerals, and is the final resting place of many notable figures, so much that reading the placards here is almost like reading a history textbook. Admiring its iconic facade from the outside is a must, and I enjoyed seeing the inside as well. Do beware though that while attending services is free, the entry ticket for sightseeing does not come cheap and it's usually very crowded as well. So if you have a short time in London, I wouldn't necessarily prioritize it. It's not the same of course, but there is also the impressive Westminster Cathedral, which is a 10 minute walk away that is completely free to enter and also really cool to look at, with a unique Byzantine style made of 12.5 million bricks. It is of course also the largest Catholic church in England, so worth checking out in its own right. Next on our list is to see Buckingham Palace. Originally built in 1703, this is of course the official residence of the British monarch, which means before you get your hopes up, you'll mostly just be staring at the palace and its 775 rooms from behind tall, highly secure fencing. But it is still one of the most iconic sites of the city, so worth a quick stop. A popular activity here is of course watching the changing of the guards a centuries-old tradition that takes place outside Buckingham Palace and other royal residences in the UK. This elaborate ritual of music and marching signals the handover of duties between the old and new guard, and is one of the most ceremonial traditions you can witness firsthand in London. Contrary to popular belief though, it doesn't actually happen every day, so be sure to check the official schedule. And beware that it does get very, very busy. Now, if you're nosy and want to see the inside of the palace, I have some good news. 
This actually is possible between July and the end of September, with some special tours in the off-season as well, when members of the public can buy a ticket to explore the palace's staterooms. Visitors will often combine this with a royal day out ticket, which also includes access to the King's Gallery, which displays items from the royal collection. Along with the Royal Muse, where you can get up close and personal with royal carriages and coaches in the palace's working stables. These attractions can be pricey though, so do know that the palace is surrounded by a number of free parks as well that are lovely to wander through, like St. James Park. Now, with all those classic sites out of the way, the next thing to do is simply wander and admire the many important buildings of Westminster. My personal favorite is a walk along Parliament Street and Whitehall, where you pass by very famous sites like this red phone booth, which is probably the most famous photo op in London, 10 Downing Street, visible only just through sealed gates, which is of course home to the UK Prime Minister, the Royal Horse Guards, who you can learn more about in the nearby Household Cavalry Museum, and a number of important memorials and statues. Around here, you'll also encounter some attractions ideal for history buffs, including the Churchill War Rooms, an underground bunker that served as a secret strategy center for Britain's wartime efforts during World War II. And for those interested in learning more about the iconic British foot guards, they have a small museum of their own that details their history and traditions. Now, if you follow Whitehall all the way along, you'll reach the ever-popular Trafalgar Square, the centerpiece of which is the imposing Nelson's Column, erected in 1843 to commemorate Admiral Horatio Nelson's victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. These days, the square is a lively public space that hosts several performances and celebrations throughout the year. Of course, on and around the square, you'll also find a number of important buildings like the High Commission of Canada and the National Gallery. This free museum is home to a vast collection of over 2,500 paintings from famous artists like da Vinci and Van Gogh, with works dating from the mid-13th century to the 1900s, a must-see for art lovers. Close by, there's also the National Portrait Gallery, which, as you probably guessed from the name, is home to numerous portraits of prominent figures who have shaped British history and culture. A short walk from here, you'll find one of London's most famous and most hated squares, Leicester Square, dismissed by many locals as the biggest tourist trap in town. Granted, the restaurants here are tremendously overpriced, and there's not a lot to do in the square itself, but there are some fun statues of British icons to admire, a cute Swiss glockenspiel that puts on a show a few times a day, and two of my London guilty pleasures, M&M World and The Lego Store. Sure, M&M's have absolutely nothing to do with London, and it's definitely an overpriced place to get candy, but there's a lot of very cute London-y photo ops inside, so I'd say it's worth a look. The same goes for the Lego store, where you'll find many of the city's top landmarks in Lego form. Now, from here, you're a short walk away from another main tourist hub, Covent Garden. This bustling district is renowned for its eclectic mix of shops, restaurants, pubs, street performers, and cultural attractions. It is almost always crowded here, but there's a ton of things to do, including watching entertainers in the piazza, a walk through Covent Garden Market, a visit to the colorful Neil's Yard, and one of my personal favorites, which is the London Transport Museum, a dream for transport nerds like me filled with tons of cool displays about the evolution of London's iconic public transport system. There's many food options around here as well, though you can definitely expect to pay a premium. If you're having trouble choosing a cuisine in particular, just around the corner is the Seven Dials Market, a food hall with 20 independent vendors and tons of tasty options from around the world, including the world's very first cheese conveyor belt restaurant, which is indeed as amazing as it sounds. Another great option for foodies is to eat your way around Chinatown. London's Chinatown has served as an epicenter of London's Chinese community since the 1950s. And today, this bustling district is filled with tons of East Asian restaurants, bakeries, and shops, with the aesthetic addition of colorful lanterns and its photogenic entry gate, which was actually only completed in 2016. This is definitely a place to come while hungry, so be prepared. Now, speaking of being prepared, a common question visitors often ask is how to pack for London. 
since the weather is always changing and there's a million different occasions to potentially dress for. Well, this is a great time to talk about this week's sponsor, Unbound Merino, an amazing Canadian company that specializes in merino wool products, which are, of course, ideal for a London trip, no matter the season. If you haven't heard of it before, merino wool is a miracle fabric that's naturally resistant to wrinkles and odor, but also wicks moisture and regulates temperature while remaining thin and breathable, making it ideal for transitioning from long flights and sweaty public transport to windy walks and unexpected stairs and climbs. I always travel with their leggings, which are great for unexpectedly chilly days. Plus, because merino wool is antibacterial and resistant to mildew, mold, and odor, you can actually rewear pieces for days, even weeks, without them smelling. This even applies to socks after walking 30,000 steps a day, which is surprisingly easy to do in London. So check out the link in my description to try them out, and use this discount code to get 10% off your first order. Thanks again to Unbound Merino for sponsoring this week's video, and now let's get back to our list of London must-dos. Now, after visiting Chinatown, you can walk over to get your mandatory photo at Piccadilly Circus, a famous junction known for its illuminated billboards. Somehow, this place has become known as London's Times Square, which I feel like is a generous comparison, but it's nonetheless an okay spot for a photo en route to some of London's most iconic shopping streets, like Regent Street, and Piccadilly, which is home to the flagship Fortnum & Mason department store, built in the 1920s with a very beautiful interior, so I'd recommend you stop inside. Plus, across the street is a fun hidden gem that most visitors miss. In the arched entryway of the Royal Academy of Arts, you'll find the wooden original prototype of the iconic red phone booths now seen all around the city. Now I know it's wild that we're still just talking about things to do in the city of Westminster, but that just goes to show how much there is to do in London. Within this borough, you'll also find many famous neighborhoods to explore, so I'll briefly summarize them now. First, be sure to explore Soho, a buzzy entertainment district known for its vibrant nightlife and shopping opportunities. There's of course the iconic Carnaby Street and Liberty London department store, but you'll also find a number of West End theaters here as well, along with some really fun bars. For a really unique experience, I can recommend heading to Cahoots, which is a 1940s themed bar set in an abandoned train station. And while here, you have to watch a West End show. The theatre and culture scene in London is truly one of the most special perks of being in the city. So make sure you watch at least a show or two during your stay. If you're on a budget, many shows actually run lotteries and rush tickets through Today Ticks which is how I personally managed to get front row Hamilton tickets for only 10 pounds. Another neighborhood to visit here is picturesque Marylebone, known for its beautiful Georgian architecture, boutique shops, and leafy streets. This neighborhood is full of beautiful finds, perfect if you're hoping to escape London's main tourist circuit. Some spots to check out include Daunt Books, which is a gorgeous Edwardian bookstore with colorful shelves stacked with books telling tales from every corner of the globe. As well as the Wallace Collection, an elegant art museum set in a fancy townhouse. And of course, a visit to 221B Baker Street is a must for Sherlock Holmes fans, though I've heard questionable things about the quality of the museum here. Now, next on the list is to explore Mayfair, one of London's most exclusive and affluent neighborhoods. This prestigious area is renowned for its upscale boutiques, art galleries, fine dining establishments, and elegant architecture. Needless to say, even breathing here feels expensive, so one of the best things to do is to just stroll around and window shop. A walk through the beautiful Burlington Arcade is a must, as well as a stop at the Mercado Mayfair, a beautiful food hall housed in a former church. While the food here is kind of overpriced and just okay, Getting a drink in this setting is a great way to unwind. Speaking of places to unwind, another highlight in the city of Westminster is Hyde Park, one of the largest and most famous parks in the city. Stretching 350 acres, this park was actually established by our favorite controversial king, Henry VIII, all the way back in 1536 as his personal hunting grounds. Today, it's a beautiful place for a stroll, with highlights including the Serpentine Lake, various memorials, 
and cool monuments, like the Duke of Wellington Arch, which is, unbeknownst to many, actually hollow on the inside. For a small fee, you can actually climb up some stairs to see little exhibits it contains, including an art gallery at the top, and also a very lovely view. From here, you're also a stone's throw from Apsley House, aka the Duke of Wellington's house, which is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated things to do in London. Photos aren't allowed inside, but trust me when I say the interiors are lavish and honestly even nicer than most of the interiors you visit at Kensington Palace. Speaking of, Hyde Park is also connected to the Kensington Gardens, which are absolutely gorgeous and home to a cool contemporary art gallery, the Serpentine Galleries, that's free and well worth checking out. Now before we move on to our next borough, it's worth noting that the city of Westminster is also home to London's own Little Venice a charming neighborhood that's so named for its picturesque canals and houseboats. This is the perfect place for a peaceful stroll if you need some time away from the tourist crowds. If you continue to Paddington, you can even rent a self-drive boat for yourself to cruise along the city's waterways through Go Boat. Now it's time to move on to things to do in the gorgeous city of London, also just known as the city which confusingly refers to the approximate square mile in central London right over here. This historic center of the city is packed with amazing sights, like St. Paul's Cathedral. Perched on the highest point in the city of London, St. Paul's is perhaps as much of a symbol of London as Big Ben, the London Eye, or sweaty rush hour commutes on the tube. With a height of 366 feet, the dome here is the second highest of its kind in the world, and yes, you can climb it for some truly amazing views. A five minute walk from St. Paul's is one of my favorite little parks in London, the ever peaceful Postman's Park. It's tiny, but holds one of the most moving and unique memorials that London has to offer, George Frederick Watts Memorial to Heroic Self-Sacrifice, which is dedicated to ordinary people who sacrifice their lives to save others, their heroic feats immortalized on ceramic tablets. Now, for a free alternative to the view at St. Paul's, but even better because you can also see St. Paul's, you can go to the rooftop terrace at nearby One New Change, which yes, does partially include a swanky rooftop restaurant and bar, but also includes a free section that offers close-up views of St. Paul's, along with farther away views of London's other prominent skyline regulars. Another place for views close to here is the Monument to the Great Fire of London. Built near the very spot where the Great Fire of London of 1666 supposedly began, this epic monument offers some of the best views in the city. And you even get a cute certificate once you finish it. At less than £6 per person, it's a lot cheaper than most paid viewpoints in London, and it's close to another one of my favourite quiet spots in the city, St Dunstan in the East. A ruined church that has been transformed into a peaceful public garden with ivy-clad arches and ancient stone walls that make for perfect photos. Now, the Great Monument of London might offer good value in terms of paid views, but on the cost front, one view does have it beat, and that's the very beautiful and very free Sky Garden. Located atop the iconic walkie-talkie building at 20 Fenchurch Street, this London viewpoint opened in 2015, offering a unique public space with lush gardens, observation decks, and restaurants. Be sure to book a ticket in advance though, or pay a little bit for an early morning ticket, which includes coffee and a pastry, so you can enter before they open to the public. If you want to get higher up, another free view in the city is the newly opened Horizon 22, which has dethroned the Shard as London's highest view. I haven't had a chance to go yet, but do make sure you book tickets in advance and let me know how it is. Finally, there's also the gorgeous free view from the garden at 120. A great pick if you don't manage to get tickets to the other two I just mentioned, because they don't require any bookings. Opened in 2019, this elevated green space offers panoramic vistas of iconic landmarks such as the Shard, the Gherkin, and Tower Bridge. And what's very cool is you can even check the capacity online. Now, going from high to low, let's talk about a very cool and free hidden gem of the city known as the Mithraeum, concealed underground amidst a sea of glassy skyscrapers. 
This Roman temple can be found beneath an office block, a relic from the centuries that London was under Roman rule, during which it was known as Londinium. Dating back to the third century, this mysterious Roman temple is dedicated to the god Mithras and was uncovered in the 1950s during excavations before being reconstructed for visitors to snoop around today. Inside, visitors will find an exhibition space with some changing displays, as well as Roman relics, and of course, a visit to the temple itself, which is a really cool immersive experience they've put together. I can definitely recommend this as a unique must-do in London. Speaking of Roman London, another thing you can do in the city is trace the remnants of the former city wall, which once stretched for two miles across the ancient city. Granted, these days there's not a lot left, but if you're a history nerd, it could be worth checking out. One attraction that used to be built on these walls was the City of London Museum, which is currently being moved to a new location and therefore unexpected to reopen until 2026. Still, this museum is a really cool place to trace the history of London from prehistoric times to present day, so be sure to check that out when it reopens. Another beautiful place to see in the city is Leadenhall Market, one of London's oldest markets that is today best known for its gorgeous Victorian design made of wrought iron and glass. On the topic of glass, another fun free spot to see in the city is the Barbican Conservatory, a lush botanical garden with exotic plants and tranquil ponds that feels worlds away from the bustling city just outside. Again, you need to reserve tickets for this one, but it is free, so definitely give it a look. Lastly, it's worth noting that the city is home to some of the most beautiful venues for a drink in London. If you want coffee, there's Host Cafe, which is housed in a beautiful Gothic church. If you want tea or fizz, there's the Royal Exchange, known for its elegant Fortnum and Mason in the center. And honestly, there's way too many beautiful and historic pubs to count, so be sure to consult my map for recommendations. Some of the nicest in my opinion though are the Old Bank of England and the Old Cheshire Cheese, a cavernous historic pub that has been around since 1667, which is when it was rebuilt, made up of a confusing tangle of rooms and floors. Now let's head across the water and cover things to do in the London Borough of Southwark. The first is a nice stroll along the South Bank. This is by far one of my favourite walks to do in the city with stunning views of London's skyline and iconic landmarks along the way. I especially love the walk between Tower Bridge and the London Eye, which takes about an hour. Along the way, you do encounter most of the top must-dos in Southwark. So let's go through them now, starting with the London Eye. Standing at 135 meters tall, this giant observation wheel offers panoramic views of the city's most iconic landmarks, but at a fairly costly price tag. I'll be honest, after so many visits to London, I still haven't been up there. And I think there are many other great views in the city that cost way less. But hey, it's iconic, so worth seeing at least from the outside. As you continue your walk along the river, you'll pass a bunch of other nice spots, including the National Theatre, which has a nice terrace, the South Bank Book Market under Waterloo Bridge, and of course, the Tate Modern, home to an extensive collection of modern and contemporary artwork from around the world. This massive museum is housed in a converted power station and is free to visit, but my top tip is to not miss the rooftop terrace at level 10. Now, after you pass the famous Millennium Bridge, officially opened in the year 2000, you'll encounter Shakespeare's famous Globe Theatre. While today's iteration of the globe dates back only to the 90s, the care with which they've replicated the original is absolutely incredible. Of course, enjoying a show here is the best way to experience it, but you can also do a tour here to get a good look. If you head slightly south from here, you'll also find one of London's most famous food markets, Borough Market, which is filled with food and produce vendors with tons of enticing options for a slightly inflated price tag. The market itself is beautiful and well worth seeing, but do try to avoid peak meal times because it is honestly not very enjoyable when it's overcrowded. Right by the market, there's also Southwark Cathedral, which is free to visit and has some unique features like its great screen and ornate altarpiece, as well as a monument and window dedicated to Shakespeare. 
Now, if you're looking for other food markets to explore, there are a few less touristy options in Southwark as well, including the Mercado Metropolitano and the Maltby Street Market, which is filled with unique food vendors on the weekend. Heading back and along the river, you'll encounter a few more classic London attractions, like the Golden Hinda, an interactive replica of the galleon used by Francis Drake to circumnavigate the world in the 1500s, as well as the HMS Belfast, a Royal Navy warship turned museum. Between the two is where you'll find London Bridge, one of the city's oldest river crossings and a historic landmark dating back to Roman times though the current structure here was only built in the late 60s and early 70s. An older iteration from the 1830s, however, can be found in Arizona of all places, which is another story for another time. And finally, you'll soon reach the bridge that everyone thinks is London Bridge, Tower Bridge, which is fair enough since it's definitely the more photogenic of the two. Officially opened in 1894, this iconic bridge is a must-see on most London itineraries, but many visitors don't realize it's actually possible to climb up and walk on its iconic walkways for unique views. They even have a few sections with a glass floor so you can test your bravery and wave at the unknowing onlookers below. For that reason, I would not recommend wearing a dress or skirt here. There's of course other cool things to do in Southwark further south from the river like the Free Imperial War Museum, which features extensive collections of military artifacts, vehicles, and exhibitions. But for now, let's move just over Tower Bridge across the river to the borough known as Tower Hamlets. While much of this borough is residential, there are a few pockets that are interesting for tourists, including one of the biggest attractions in the city, the Tower of London. This UNESCO World Heritage Site is one of Britain's most iconic landmarks. Dating back to the 11th century, this historic fortress has served as a royal palace, prison, and treasury, with highlights like the crown jewels to ogle at, along with a bunch of cool things to see, including the White Tower, which is home to an impressive armory. If you're a history buff, this is definitely a London must-see. One very unique and cool experience here that I don't hear people talk about though, is the Ceremony of the Keys a secretive centuries-old ceremony at the Tower of London where they lock everything up for the night. A ritual that you can actually watch for only five pounds. That said, tickets can be hard to come by, so be sure to book on the first working day of the month at noon for the next month, which is when tickets are released. And if you need a place for a drink, the Dickens Inn is a really beautiful, somewhat hidden option over at St. Catherine Docks. Now, north of here, you'll find a classic Sunday tradition in East London, the Columbia Road Flower Market. While realistically, most tours don't have reason to buy fresh flowers during their trip, this is one of the most beautiful markets in London, with gorgeous stalls crammed with fresh flowers and plants at affordable prices. If you have longer to spend, this might be a nice Sunday morning activity to consider, though be sure to come early to avoid the crowds. Speaking of markets, a more sensical choice might be a visit to the vibrant Spitalfields Market, which dates back to the 17th century and today offers a diverse array of stalls selling fashion, crafts, and most importantly, food from around the world. This is a great, though somewhat pricey place for lunch, and a nice jumping point for visiting other areas nearby, like the eclectic and lively Shoreditch. While once known as a hipster paradise, it's safe to say that Shoreditch is fairly mainstream these days, though it's still a very fun neighborhood that feels worlds away from the classic London landmarks in Westminster, with striking street art, fun markets, unique entertainment, and many, many cool bars. While it's not necessarily a sightseeing neighborhood with attractions to tick off your list, it is a very fun place to spend an evening. So be sure to come by if you're looking to experience another side of London. And if you're into big city vibes, another interesting place to visit is the thriving financial district of Canary Wharf, home to sleek skyscrapers, bustling shopping malls, and waterfront promenades. While for a long time this was considered mainly a business zone with not much to see, they've put a lot of work into making Canary Wharf an appealing destination, with lots of options for restaurants and entertainment, 
including barbecue and hot tub boat rentals on the canal. There are some sightseeing opportunities as well, like at the Crossrail Place roof garden, as well as the Free Museum of London Docklands, which has some really interesting displays about the history of the Docklands area. If you're looking to explore a little farther away from the tourist center, this could be a fun option, though I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to come here on a first visit. Now let's move on to things to do in the London borough of Camden. The first and most obvious is to visit Camden Market, one of London's most iconic shopping destinations. Dating back to the 1970s, this sprawling market offers a diverse range of stalls selling everything from vintage clothing and handmade crafts to international street food and robot rave clothes. Truth be told, these days the market is known for being fairly touristy and overpriced, but it's still a neat spot in the city to check out, especially given its proximity to one of the nicest parks and views in the city, Regent's Park and Primrose Hill. Regent's Park is one of London's most beloved green spaces, with lush gardens, scenic walking paths, and of course, the famous London Zoo. The main highlight for me though is Primrose Hill, where you get a gorgeous view of the skyline from afar, and when you visit early in the summer, there's also Queen Mary's Rose Garden, the largest rose garden in London, which is a colourful delight. Another cool spot to visit in this borough is the Sir John Soane Museum which is a very unique and free attraction left behind by knight architect Sir John Soane, who wanted his house to become a free space for the public to visit, under the condition that it remained untouched from the moment he died. So even today, it's filled with his crazy collection of stuff as he left it 200 years ago. This is definitely one of the most unique places to visit in London, and less than 10 minutes away from here is one of my favourite recent finds, the very quirky Novelty Automation, which is home to several satirical, homemade arcade machines that you can buy tokens to play. Hard to describe, but fantastically weird and great if you're looking for a more offbeat activity. Speaking of offbeat, a museum just north of here is the London Postal Museum, an admittedly very nerdy attraction that is dedicated to you guessed it, the history of British postal communication. I know that doesn't sound super thrilling, but a special highlight of a visit here is you get to hop on the mail rail, an immersive 15 minute ride through the original tunnels of the historic mail rail network, offering insights into the city's Victorian era postal service and the transportation of mail beneath the streets of London. I recognize that this is a super nerdy London activity, but I honestly had a great time. And if you're a different kind of nerdy, this neighborhood is also home to a bunch of other museums, including the Charles Dickens Museum, the Foundling Museum, and of course, the British Museum, filled to the brim with amazing artifacts from around the world. Another part of Camden that's all the rage these days is King's Cross, of course, best known for its train station, where yes, you can indeed get a cheesy photo op of you jumping into platform nine and three quarters. But there's more to this neighborhood now than just the train station. There is, for instance, the Coles Drop Yard, a former industrial area that has been transformed into a vibrant retail and dining destination, as well as London's prettiest floating bookshop, Word on the Water, which is moored along the Regent's Canal. Housed within a charming 1920s Dutch barge, this quirky bookshop offers a cozy and atmospheric setting to browse books, or as I luckily did, get stranded during a thunderstorm. Finally, if you're looking for a quieter day of exploration, venture northwards towards leafy Hampstead, a charming village-like enclave nestled in the northwest of London. There are some really beautiful spots to visit here, like the Hill Garden and Pergola, as well as Hampstead Heath, and a few nice house museums, like the Burgh House and Kenwood House. Now let's move west again to tackle some things to do in the famously well-to-do borough of Kensington and Chelsea. The first is a visit to the Victoria and Albert Museum, also known as the V&A. Founded in 1852, the V&A is the largest museum of applied arts, decorative arts, and design in the entire world, with a permanent collection containing over 2 million objects. 
Inside, you'll find a stunning collection of paintings, sculptures, jewelry, fashion pieces, and more. All housed in a gorgeous building with an opulent cafe that makes the perfect place for a break. Nearby are also several other excellent free museums, including the Science Museum, which is dedicated to the history of scientific advancements, with over 15,000 objects on display. And the strikingly beautiful Natural History Museum, which is dedicated to the diversity of life on Earth, as well as the processes and forms that shape our planet. Now, in this area is another London icon, the legendary Royal Albert Hall. The best way to experience this venue is, of course, by booking tickets to see a show. But if the timing doesn't align, they do also offer paid tours as well, which includes access to special spaces not typically open to the public, including the separate entrance and lounge facilities used by the royal family. And once again, speaking of the royal family, another place to visit in this area is Kensington Palace, best known as the birthplace of Queen Victoria, and the current home of Prince William and Kate. Though of course your visit is restricted to only the public areas like the King and Queen State Apartments. They often have cool exhibitions here which would make a visit worthwhile. But to be honest, palace-wise, I think some of the others outside of London, like Hampton Court Palace, offer a much better experience. Now, a short walk away from here is one of the most beautiful pubs in London. The Churchill Arms, known for its facade which is decked in flowers in warmer months and decked in Christmas trees and lights for the holidays. While admiring the outside is fun, the inside is actually really nice and cozy. Plus, there's a great Thai restaurant hidden in the back. Definitely worth a look if you want a more relaxing thing to do in London before tackling another one of the city's most popular neighborhoods, which is Notting Hill. Forever tourist central thanks to Instagram and the 90s rom-com of the very same name, Charming Notting Hill is a picturesque piece of London known for its colourful houses, leafy squares, and bustling markets, including the Portobello Road Market, whose main day is Saturday. On the culture front, there's also the Museum of Brands, which is a really cool museum if you're an advertising and marketing nerd like me. With a vast collection of over 12,000 items, this unique museum chronicles the story and evolution of consumer culture through the lens of branding and packaging, dating all the way back to the Victorian era. And if you're into shopping and the finer things, another neighborhood to explore in this borough is Knightsbridge, with its most iconic spot being Harrods, one of the most famous department stores in the world. This swanky department store is a haven for luxury shopping, Though, there are some architectural highlights as well, like the Egyptian escalator. Next on our list is to explore Chelsea. Just like Knightsbridge, this neighborhood is known as one of the wealthiest in the city, with gorgeous streets to explore, beautiful restaurants and pubs to enjoy, plus a handful of tourist-friendly sites like the Saatchi Gallery, a bright and airy gallery with rotating art exhibits, as well as the Chelsea Physic Garden one of the oldest botanical gardens in Britain. Of course, one of the best ways to enjoy Chelsea is to just walk around and explore for yourself. There's tons of beautiful corners pretty much all over. And right across the river on the beautiful Chelsea Bridge, you'll find the newly reopened Battersea Power Station, one of London's most recognizable landmarks and a symbol of the city's industrial heritage. These days, it's a shopping and dining destination, which has its own special viewpoint, Lift 109. Now, moving outside of central London, one must-do I recommend for those with the time is to explore Greenwich. This is probably one of my favourite boroughs in London, and you could easily spend a full day here. Highlights include the old Royal Naval College and its beautiful painted hall, the Royal Observatory, home of Greenwich Mean Time, where you can walk on the Prime Meridian, the National Maritime Museum, which is the largest museum of its kind in the world, full of ships, boats, and educational displays. Cuddy Sark, the world's last surviving tea clipper. The Queen's House, which is a beautiful art gallery. Greenwich Park, with all its beautiful paths and views. And Greenwich Market, a great but busy place to grab a bite. One of my favorite London pubs can be found here as well 
the Trafalgar Tavern, which while very busy and very pricey, has some beautiful interior decor and even more amazing views. As a bonus, while in Greenwich, you can also hop on the IFS Cloud cable car, which seems like a fun ride, but honestly, the areas on either side aren't the most exciting, so I wouldn't go out of my way just to ride it. Now, after this very long video, I feel like you'd be surprised to hear that I've really only just scratched the surface with what there is to do in London. For those with more time, I can highly recommend taking a day trip further out, with tons of amazing options from beautiful gardens and epic palaces, to the Warner Brothers Studio Tour, where you can step into the magical world of Harry Potter to see iconic sets, props, and costumes. On that note, if you are a pop culture nerd, I should mention that a really fun thing to do in London, if you have the time, is to go to a TV show taping. There are tons of free opportunities to be part of a studio audience in London. I've personally been to the Graham Norton show twice and really enjoyed it though it can be quite a time-consuming activity that's not really close to the main site, so only do this if you have lots of time. Now, believe it or not, I have many more recommendations of things to do and see in London, so be sure to read the full written guide for more, along with a map of all these places we discussed. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next week, bye!